like to call the June 21, 2011 meeting of the Buncombe County Board of Commissioners to order. And as always, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'll join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll recognize Vice Chair Stanley for the invocation. <clears throat> Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and all your many blessings to us. We ask special this day your special blessings on our budget meeting. Guide and direct us in all we consider and do. And Lord, most importantly, hold our troops in your loving hands. Protect them as they protect us. Bless them and their families for the selfish acts they perform for us in our time of need. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Next we have uh, do the ethics statement. In accordance with the code of ethics that's been adopted by this board, it's the duty of every board member to avoid both the appearance and actual interest, uh, appearance of conflict or conflicts of interest. Does any board member know of any actual or apparent conflict of interest tonight in any matter coming before our board? Me. No, sir. No, sir. Then we will proceed. Um, is there a motion to follow the agenda as printed with the addition of an add-on of the lease to the, um, from the school board of Buncombe County, uh, the Lease Creek property, uh, I think Cellular Tower? Right, so move. Okay, is there a second? Second. There's been a motion by Commissioner Peterson, a second by Vice Chair Stanley uh, to adopt the budget as adopted, which... Not, not the budget. I'm excuse me, adopt the agenda as <laughs> not quite you yet. You'll make it a short meeting. <laughs> it would be very short, yes. You, you, may, you may get a good <laughs> we, may get, we may do that in a minute, but not yet. Uh, to adopt the agenda as printed include with the change. That it also includes adopting the matters under the consent agenda. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, <clears throat> no. We will follow the agenda as amended, unanimous consent. Good news. We have little Joe Brown an icon of our community and good friend to all of us. Joe, thank you for coming here for a special presentation about a new book about Buncombe County. I thought you brought us a goober lip. <laughs> Don't let him open his mouth until I get through just a minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, administrators. I didn't come down to grunt and groan, bitch and moan about anything. I have a beautiful, beautiful lady with me and some gifts. Now, I must inquire about a clandestine breakfast that I have been meeting with for about 20 years, and we always have a BS report. That's Brown Stanley. <laughs> but Stanley has not been there lately. Oh dear. And Dr. Sloan has substituted, so we only have had a partial BS report. But if you all could persuade him, in 13 years helping me on the air, 13 years as a volunteer, and cooking for hundreds of folks out in Big Sandy Mush, I still can't forgive him for leaving out there. He's missed, and we will applaud him when he gets there, but not a standing ovation. <laughs> now, uh, we have something for you that has taken years and years and years, and since you are the governing body of Buncombe County in townships and municipalities and communities, we thought we should bring them to you first. And to introduce what I have for you, I have the author, and she is a very lovely, vivacious young lady who happens to be the author. Now, the photographer who is an intellectual photographer, I've known three in my life, June Glenn, Malcolm Gamble, and Michael Ompenhaf. But Michael is on assignment. He can't be here. But I can present Laura.
thank you so much for having us here. Thank you, little Joe, for arranging this. This is a gift from Grateful Steps Publishing House, a local publisher here in Asheville. We have a lovely bookshop down on South Lexington Avenue. And this is a life's work of the publisher, Mickey, Dr. Mickey Cabanis, Mickey Cabanis Utzler. This has been her vision, her um, past husband's vision, Dan Cabanis, to create a tribute to the beauty of Asheville's architecture. Mm -hmm. And I took on the project of writing the architectural history of the city. And at first it started as an academic project where I just wanted to know the story of each building and the style in which it was designed. And then I would learn the story of another building and learn that they had a relationship through architects all the way back to Richard Morris Hunt's influence. And then I started to see that the building stories actually connect with the history of the entire nation and from there the entire world. The book became a history of the 20th century told through Asheville's buildings and they say that poverty is a friend of preservation and we endured that poverty from the 1929 crash up until the 70s and now we emerge from it. I learned while writing this book that we now benefit from the wealth that was saved during those difficult years. Mm -hmm. And the book is an uh, invitation for everyone who lives here, even though we're incredibly busy, even though we have a million things on our mind at any given time, to look up, mm -hmm. not just at the beautiful mountains surrounding us, but at the architecture in which we work, in which we do our business, and learn its story so that we can preserve these buildings and make the most of the legacy left behind by the people who built them. And that is a commitment to the aesthetics and to business and to a wonderful balance of the both. So I hope you will enjoy Look Up Asheville as much as I loved writing it. It is a love letter to the city and it's a great joy to be giving it to you today. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. What we're going to present really is a tool of truth. Now, I know you're thinking about a tool of truth. I think you're going to see a tool of truth in this, mm. if you don't mind. May we approach? Yes, yes sir. sir, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yes. Wow. I'm ready. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have two extra copies for the county manager and the clerk. Thank nice. you. And I think you should present that. We'll do that. Okay? Thank you very much. And everybody else, before I leave, I found something. And I would like to share it with you before I leave. Uh, I know you're going to use it. And I'll give two to uh, Holly. Thank you. Two to Ray. <laughs> well, that's for you and your spouse. Oh, thanks, sir. I appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. Oh, my. Uh, Shall I take this? Yes, thank you. Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Jack. Little Joe, I'll see you in the morning. Okay, now I'll if you need get, get in contact again. with any of them, you can look in there for a card. Right. But all you have to do is tell Bill Stanley, and he'll tell me on Wednesday morning if you need me, and I'll be glad to help him anyway. Thank okay. you. Bye. And the Bye. stolen from David Gant pins Bye. were Joe Joe Brown's <laughs> idea about 25 years ago at least. So thank you so much. <laughs> the, the, the folks, the pen says. Stolen from David Gant's law office. <laughs> yeah, it's. <laughs> thank you. Hey, little Joe Brown there. All right. Going. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, ma'am, so much. Very nice. Next, we have uh, Doug Sutton with the Farmer's Market. He's a manager, and we're going to hear about what's going on at the Farmer's Market. And thank you for being here, Ms. Sutton. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioners and Carol. Thank you for helping set this up, too. Yes, sir. Um, okay, we got, you know, and. Um, well, that was a this gentleman, young lady. That was a hard kind of act to follow, but it reminded me of one of the vendors on the market. We got a lot of characters out there, and he was telling me a story about a 
a farmer or a guy was wanting to sell a horse and he'd advertise it and the the um, guy came out to look at the horse and it looked good I mean it had good confirmation didn't have a big sway back or anything so how much you want for the horse he said two hundred dollars and he said two hundred dollars man that thing's worth five times yeah but he said it, to me it don't look so good it just don't look so good and so the guy went ahead and bought it took it home loaded up on trail took it home loaded it out in the pasture and and uh, the horse started running to the fence, and ran to the barn door, ran to the, he realized it was blind. So he called the guy back and said, you sold me a blind horse. He said, yeah, I told you it didn't look so good. <laughs> it didn't look so good. So it depends on how you word things, I guess. That's a good one. This, this first shot up here, I don't know, the, the book you got, I don't know if that picture might be in there. She talked about some of the buildings in downtown Asheville, but that's uh, Lexington Street. Uh, market that was uh, started in 1938. In fact, we have one of the vendors out there now in the retail buildings. He he was probably 10 years old and he grew up on that market. And you know when when the market came, uh, this picture reminds me too. Also, I don't know if you guys remember. You know, hopefully none of us are as old. You know, back in 1938, my dad's 29, 28, 83 years old. But um, the 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 ad, the tobacco ad, they had I think it was a Virginia Slims. It said, "You've come a long way, baby." So this is kind of where we started our roots. Uh, I don't know many familiar with Bud Sales. He's a Fairview farmer. He told the Asheville Citizens Times in 1973, he said, quote, we sure do need a farmer's market here in Asheville. Little did he realize what the future would bring to this area. Area state legislators and leaders would join hands and work together to bring about a complex that would rival in the southeast of that time. In the summer of 1974, a study was undertaken by the United States Department of Agriculture to help improve farmer's market and wholesale food distribution facilities at Asheville, North Carolina to replace old obsolete facilities that no longer met the needs of modern food marketing. To meet the needs of farmers and grocers in the area, farmers market and a center for wholesale food distribution was recommended. This would involve the relocation of current farmers market located on Lexington Avenue, the picture you see here, and, the, and also there was a Riverside market, an old tobacco warehouse located on French Broad River. The decision was made to purchase 20 acres on Brevard Road to Interstate 40, next to Interstate 40, which is where we are currently located. Um, Buncombe County, Farmers Home Administration, Department of Transportation, a grant from Appalachian Regional Commission, and other state funds contributed to developing the grounds and buildings we have today. Today, the property consists of 36 acres and 14 buildings. Um, this is, get the slide. Okay, there we go. Um, I don't know if many of you go right on Brevard Road, that's the sign you'll see the marquee welcoming you to the market. Um, this is what we have today. We've got retail shops, wholesale year-round produce, a garden center, restaurant and deli, a farmer's shed, and local in-season, which has local in-season produce. The decision, you know, that decision was made to purchase the 20 acres. Uh, there are three kinds of produce markets, a wholesale, a retail, and farmers. The WNC Farmers Market has a blend of all three, wholesale and farmers supply, restaurants, schools, hospitals, churches, independent groceries, stores, and produce stands. Our retail vendors sell directly to the public. We all know Asheville is a wonderful place to live. It is also a great tourist destination. Our retail folks see lots of tourists and, and coming to the area in the summer and fall. My desire and goal is that more of our local people will come and shop also at the market, you know, take advantage of that. So I just want to give you a brief overview. This is in the retail area. Um, you know, our summer months are just beginning, June, and we go through October with the leaf lookers coming up, so it's really crowded. Weekends are really special. Uh, the, we have the garden center, the Jesse Israel and Sons Garden Center. They've got lots of plant material for your landscaping needs. Uh, of course, the Moose Cafe, that's just the good old country style food. And I used to be in sales, and when I was out in the county, the places you wanted to go eat at were all, where all the pickup trucks were. So you know, that, that parking lot stays full. You know. um, what's in season? You know, you hear a lot about local and, and those kind of things. Being a wholesale market, they pull product in from, you know, different places. But it, what's in season? Fall our season, April, you know, we've got strawberries, ramps, greens, onions. May, again, strawberries, peaches. June, we've got new crop of wild honey flower, blueberries, which I think hopefully you guys have some, have some in Thank front you. of you can sample. Uh, peaches, tomatoes, greasy beans, and half runners. Those are local uh, specialties. Eggplant, pepper, sweet corn, lodi, which is an early cooking apple. Um, July, freestone peaches will start coming in. Of course, we've got watermelons, cantaloupes, blackberries, squash. Could have brought some blackberries today, too, but I think, you know, I want you to come out and shop kind of <laughs> entice you to come out and do that. August, we've got muscadine, scuppernong grapes, apples, lots of varieties there, honey crisp, also sweet potatoes and Irish potatoes coming in that time of year. September, we'll, again, 25 varieties of apples, um, and uh, again, sweet potatoes. October, the pink lady apples, those are good, you know, consumers like those. Pumpkins, fall squash, and then Christmas, Christmas <coughs> trees finish out our year. Again, that's 
farmers will come the farmers will come into the market you know we we are a state we're part of the department of agriculture but our funding some of our funding comes from the legislator but we all know the, the tight economic times we're in but we're probably about 80 85 percent receipt supported so people that use the market are paying to use it so we're not you know a big big burden on the on the tax revenue and this this is our farmer shed north carolina farmers only so they can set up and sell their produce so they'll come in and bring it in by the truck and sell it by the bushel or half bushel you know in economic times in my mind the economy is kind of broken down to essentials and extras you know when fuel prices go up we see we kind of cut back on our budget on buying extra things going to movies and those kind of things but you know moms if they want to look for a good deal they can pool their money resources together and come out and buy a 25 pound uh, bushel of uh, tomatoes you know it comes you know it depends on the price you know supply and demand you can get it anywhere from 50 cents a pound so that's a pretty good deal this is just our drive through truck shed this is the wholesale area again supplying restaurants and churches and schools small dealers building where you get smaller quantity items year-round of course these are peaches we got peaches in now if you if you've been down that lower uh, watermelon shed area that's that area down there and that barn that's that's the Biltmore property over there so we're good neighbors with them it's, it's a nice place to be again another grower selling peaches of course watermelons <clears throat> And one of the things we like to do throughout the year, especially beginning in April, is to kind of, hey, our season's coming. We want to make the public aware. We have a, a barbecue festival. We've got bluegrass bands. Carol, you've been out there for that. Yeah, you, yes. That's an enjoyable time. Um, the Herb Festival. This year, we, that's been going on probably for you know, 15 years or more. But this year, our traffic count, we counted like 33,000 people came through during a three-day period, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So that's become quite, quite a big event and a draw. Of course, we, we do like to do lots of events for the you know, community. We have Watermelon Day. We've got Apple Day, Tomato Sampling Day. So we do a lot of events to try to bring in the community, local community. So that's a, a watermelon eating, seed spitting contest. And there's the Watermelon Queen back there. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we finish out the year with Christmas trees. And so we probably have one of the largest Christmas tree lots in western North Carolina, you know, in the area. So this is, this is where we're at. This is our... Um, you know, web website information that you can go on our website and look up information for events. That's where we're located, and we welcome you and thank that we're part of the community. And I know, growing up as a kid, my grandparents are from Jackson County, and we come up to visit and going towards Franklin. We always saw Sea Rock City, you know, the, the Ruby, go Ruby Mine, you know, digging. So I think we have a Ruby Mine here in Asheville, with not just the market, but all the other businesses here too. So thank you for your time. Thank Good. you so thank much. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Any questions? We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Get out there about once a month at least because I run out of that good Ash County hoop cheese. They make the best in 20 pound hoops. Ooh. It lasts about a month. Yeah. Well, that, you know, that's one good. of those value added products that we want to promote in North Carolina. So thank you for coming. By the way, blueberries come from Gro where is Grover's? What county it's is Grover's? Cle it's Cleveland, Cleveland County. Cleveland? All right, okay. That's not far down the road. Okay. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Next, we have proclamations. Commissioner Jones will give the HIV testing day proclamation to Jennifer Poor and Michael Harney. Go. So the people standing behind me are the folks that do this work day in and day out and uh, we appreciate their commitment to um, turning around this epidemic that we're facing in our, in our, in our community, in our country, in our world, which is HIV um, AIDS. So I would like to read this proclamation and then afterwards I will turn it over to these wonderful folks to, um, and I'll introduce y'all then uh, to say a few words. So this is a proclamation about HIV testing day. Whereas the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention report that in the United States there are approximately 56,000 new cases of HIV infection every year and an estimated 250,000 people who do not realize that they carry the virus. And whereas HIV prevention efforts are hampered by a low sense of urgency in spite of the fact that in North Carolina nearly 30% of newly diagnosed HIV cases have already advanced to AIDS which leads to numerous complications, costly hospitalization, and increased risk of death. And whereas the Buncombe County Health Department provides HIV testing and urges all Americans to be tested for HIV, 
HIV to safeguard their own health and to help bring the epidemic under control. And whereas ending the HIV AIDS epidemic is a community as well as an individual responsibility. And whereas Western North Carolina AIDS Project as a regional leader in HIV prevention education and case management services provides information about and access to convenient free and confidential HIV testing year round. Now therefore let it be proclaimed by the Board of Commissioners for the County of Buncombe as follows that June the 27th 2011 be proclaimed HIV testing day in Buncombe County. That this board does hereby encourage the residents of Buncombe County to contact the Buncombe County Health Department to get their free and confidential HIV test. And third, that this proclamation be effective upon its adoption. Um, Chairman Gant and uh, colleagues, I would move uh, adoption of this proclamation. Second. There's been a motion by Commissioner Jones, a second by Vice Chair Stanley. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Proclamation is adopted 5-0. I'll let these good advocates uh, say a few words. Hi, I'm Jennifer Poor. I'm a volunteer with Western North Carolina AIDS Project, WINCAP. Um, on June the 24th at the ABIPA office on Eagle Street, we're having a, our National HIV Testing Day there. Um, it's from 4 to 7. Um, we're going to have gifts and information and just like I said, free testing for all. Uh, just come and get informed. And if you want to do your family as a favor, do your community a favor, please get informed. Talk to your children. I'm a mother of a daughter who's HIV positive. I lost a grandchild to AIDS. So it's very important to me personally, but I don't want no one else to have to go through what my family went through back in 98. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Mike? Thank you, distinguished commission members. My name is Michael Harney. I work with the Western North Carolina AIDS Project and have been in this field since 1993. I certainly would encourage people to know their status. As uh, we heard in the proclamation, about 250,000 people in this country don't know their HIV status, and through them, more infections occur. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has some great and uh, very easy to read information. It is important that we educate our young people uh, when we look at some of the STD transmissions uh, in this state. 75% uh, of chlamydia cases occur among people who are under 24 years of age. About 66% of gonorrhea cases occur among people who are under 24 years of age. And uh, we know that, that HIV is transmitted in the same ways that those two are transmitted. So if you don't know your status, please remember that there are free and confidential places to get tested in Buncombe County. And if it's, this is not the county in which to get tested, we encourage everybody in North Carolina to find a county where they're comfortable getting tested. It is important to know one's status for a lifelong, uh, extended life now with HIV. It is not the death sentence that it was in the early epidemic. The last person we'd like to speak is um, Sue Ellen Morrison from the Buncombe County Department of Health. Thank you very much for making this a proclamation for Buncombe County. Uh, we do want to bring awareness and we appreciate your support in this proclamation. We do have HIV testing available at the Health Department Monday through Friday. It's, it's always free and people can come in at any time. It is walk-in or they can make an appointment if they prefer to. We want to also appreciate our partners in the community who bring awareness and education about HIV. So thank you again to WINCAP and their help. And, and I believe you, you can get tested in another county if someone chooses not to get tested here. Absolutely, yes. You, you, anywhere you want to go, North Carolina. Health Carolina. Department, yes. And also um, private providers. Uh, we've been encouraging private providers in the hospital to make this a, a common, a regular test for them to provide to their clients because oftentimes it's undiagnosed. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Wonderful. Next, hey, we have, uh, Yes, sir. About 22 years ago when I first got elected, they used to hold those cleanup days and they gave you a hat and a pair of white gloves and sent you out to clean up. And I was up there with a couple behind the auditorium now, by the, the Civic Center, right down that wall where people used to sit and do funny things, I guess. And I was really cleaning up the trash there and something stuck in my finger and I raised up and there's a hypodermic needle sticking mm. in my finger. Mm. You don't bet you, that, bet you that I get HIV testing every time I go to the doctor every year. Once you've gotten HIV tested, then you know your HIV status. So it's not something that would lie dormant in the body. Um, and when, when we get tested through blood, it's, uh, it shows nine days ago and anything earlier. The, the technology is that, that advanced now in North Carolina. Um, there's also a needle exchange program of Asheville that occurs here 
And, um, and the fact is we exchange about 2,000 needles a, a month in North Carolina, in, in Buncombe County. Thank you all so much. Next we have Commissioner Peterson will be giving a Parks, Greenway and Recreation Month proclamation. Uh, Lynn Pegg and Jamie Sharp, I think, are here from Parks, Greenway and Recs to accept them. Well, we know these folks are award-winning and uh, on the cutting edge and really special to us. And I don't, and I wanted to say one of the funnest things I do, but I don't guess that's good English. One of the best things that you get every month is this um, newsletter from these good folks that says, let's go out and play or come out and play and I always look to see what's happening with our Parks, Recreation and Greenway folks. They're super, that's all I can say. What they do is forefront for um, Parks, Recreation and Greenway folks across the the state and I'm gonna read this proclamation and I'm hoping when they make some comments that they might say something about a little um, meeting that we had last Friday that some of us attended that might be exciting. It's giving you a little, yeah. Okay. Um, this is a proclamation of uh, Parks, Greenways and Recreation Month. Whereas parks and recreation programs are an integral part of communities throughout the country, including here in Buncombe County. And whereas our parks, greenways, and our recreation programs are vitally important to establishing and maintaining the quality of life in our communities, ensuring the health of our, st of our citizens, and contributing to the economic and environmental well-being of a community and region. And whereas parks, greenways, and recreation programs build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease, provide therapeutic recreation services for those who are developmentally or physically disabled, and also improve the mental and emotional health of all citizens. And whereas parks, greenways, and recreation programs increase a community's economic prosperity through increased property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, and the attraction and retention of businesses and crime reduction. And whereas parks, recreations, and Greenways and recreation areas are fundamental to the environmental well-being of our community. And whereas parks, greenways, and natural recreation areas improve water quality, protect groundwater, prevent flooding, improve the quality of the air we breathe, provide vegetated, vegetative buffers to development, and produce habitat for wildlife. And whereas this county has begun a Greenway Master Plan update to ensure that natural recreation areas protect the ecological beauty of our community and provide place for children and adults to con connect with nature and recreate outdoors. And whereas the United States House of Representatives has designated July as Parks and Recreation Month. And whereas Buncombe County recognizes the benefits derived from parks and recreation resources. Now, therefore be it proclaimed by the Board of Commissioners for the day of for the County of Buncombe that the month of July be proclaimed Parks, Greenways and Recreation Month in Buncombe County and that this board encourages all Buncombe County citizens to get out and enjoy the wonderful parks in our county and to learn more about the re recreation programs offered and the Greenways Master Plan currently underway. And that I recommend, Mr. Chairman, that we adopt this proclamation. Second. Been a motion by Commissioner Peterson, a second by Commissioner Bailey. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The motion carries 5 0. Thank you. And uh, here's Lynn Peck. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for your support of parks and recreation and greenways. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit and then let Jessica Stevemer tell you about the special program that was last Friday. Um, we would want to invite everybody to get out, come out visit the parks, come out visit the five county pools, get active, see the county, and come out and play. <laughs> That's right. Here's Jessica. Hi, I'm Jessica Stevemer. I'm the Fund Development Coordinator uh, for Buncombe County Parks. I work closely with Lucy Crown. She's our Parks and Greenway Planner, and many of you were at our kickoff last week. Uh, in 2008, we brought our comprehensive parks, and, uh, parks master plan 
with a subchapter of the Greenway Master Plan to this board for approval, and it was approved. It was a very rough, uh, basically just a document outlining why we need greenways and a very basic map. Uh, since that time, since Lucy and I have been hired on, we have uh, been gathering the resources and forming the partnerships to start an, an actual uh, an update of the Greenway Master Plan. This will be a much larger, comprehensive, countywide Greenway Plan, which will look at all of the existing master plans done by, I think there's one for almost every municipality in Buncombe County, and some of the plans that have been done by Land of Sky uh, to create a comprehensive plan that will link, basically, create an alternative and sustainable transportation plan. So this will, is going to be a very, very, very long process, but in fruition, we hope that you'll be able to work with the transit system and your bike and your foot and be able to walk from one area walk or cycle from one area of the county to the other so last friday we had our kickoff to the master plan at the arboretum we had about i think 90 attendees uh, and we had we heard from elected officials from almost every municipality and from the county commissioners so it's just we're gonna have lots of public meetings throughout this planning process you'll be kept very abreast if you're interested in learning more please contact our department uh other than that Thank you, ladies. We're looking forward to following the progress of the master plan, and there was a lot of energy and a lot of um, interest with all of our municipalities. And as most of you know, there are six municipalities within Buncombe County. And I usually, when I give a talk, I'll usually give a treat to whoever can name them all. But uh, they, we know about Asheville, but there are five other ones, and I'll leave that to um, another day. <laughs> Next, we have a public hearing on the retaining wall ordinance, and we have John Creighton, Assistant County Manager, to tell us about uh, what the ordinance says and uh, what we're trying to do with it. John? Mr. Chairman, board members, uh, this has been a, a long process. I mean, we, we started developing this ordinance back... Uh, it's back, really back in the winter. Brought it to the planning board, and at that time, uh, planning board went through, brought in some engineers. We, obviously, we have an engineer on the uh, on the planning board, and went through and took a long, hard look about what we need to do about upgrading our ordinance as it as it reflects to to uh, retaining walls. I want to go through a, a brief PowerPoint here show you a little bit about the high points of what we've done as far as changing uh, the ordinance. And I think when you look at, at retaining walls is that <clears throat> obviously retaining walls usually have something on top of them or they usually have something in front of them or, or both. So obviously there's a, fa a safety factor there that we want to take a look at that if there are problems then we don't want it falling across property lines or we, you know, we don't want whatever is on top of that uh, to start having structural problems also. Obviously, you, the retaining walls come into areas where there's steep slopes uh, and then the current building code in North Carolina addresses uh, retaining walls and a commercial establishment that starts at five feet that you've got to have an engineer and at four feet on residential you've got to have an engineer to, to basically design the wall. We've incorporated a, another additive that I'll talk about here in a few minutes to, to the building code. And then obviously large retaining walls do have visual impact and can become quite obtrusive as, as we've all heard about the retaining wall that's on uh, Highway 74. my luck that oh it's going it's showing okay <clears throat> first of all we looked at at terracing obviously we want to stay away from a solid retaining wall that is uh, 82 feet in height so <laughs> What we want to do is when you look at terracing, uh, it makes the wall more structurally sound. Uh, you can do maintenance on the wall a lot easier. And what we're recommending that in any, any retaining wall that's over 20 foot high 
has to be stepped back. At 20 foot, it has to be stepped back 10 foot. And then inter intervals after that, every 15 feet, you've got to also set it set back at 10 foot. So that, that allows us to do several things in the fact that, one, it allows easier maintenance uh, on the retaining wall. Also, it allows us to, to start doing some landscaping. Um, when, you, when we look at landscaping, at, at 20 foot, any wall that is 20 foot high and is within 100 feet of a road, whether it's private or public, has to be landscaped. If it's further back than uh, the 100 feet, then any wall that is at 30 foot cumulative height has to be landscaped. We want to start out at the bottom and have a combination of trees and bushes across the front of the retaining wall. And then at the setback at that 10 foot intervals, wherever that may be, we want a combination of bushes and we also want, on, want vines. At the 20 foot height, we also want at least 50 feet of the wall to have a, a structure that, that vines can run up. And then once the the retaining wall gets 30 feet in cumulative height. We want 75 feet, or 75 percent, rather, of the wall to have some kind of vegetative support uh, that will allow vegetation to come up and also hide, hide the wall. I'm not having a whole lot of luck here. Uh -huh. uh, also, when you look at the wall that any time that there is a wall that's over 10 foot high, we want a, a four foot fence. If there's within a road, within 10 foot of the wall, we want it to have a guardrail. So obviously we, this is a safety factor that we want to, to make sure that uh, we don't have problems with whether it's children or cars or whatever to, to interfere and come off the, off the wall. Engineer certification. Like I said before, that at four foot residential, at five foot uh, commercial, there has to be an engineer involved. What we've seen, especially on the, high, on the wall that's on 74, is that you'll have one engineer design it, and then you'll have another engineer someplace else to sign off on that wall. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to have the engineer who designed it follow the whole thing through and be the person that signs off on it. I think that's real important to follow the thing through and then all of a sudden like say you know obviously the engineer that signs off that may not have designed it he's got the plans but he doesn't know exactly what maybe the engineer that originally designed it had in mind so we want that engineer to come back and follow the whole project through there has been discussions about possibility of of making a, a developer or, or the engineer have a bond uh, we do require bonds Obviously, a long-term bond on, on stormwater because that's a long-term maintenance of those facilities. We require the developer that comes in on, on a subdivision to have a bond to, to make sure that the roads are put in properly and that those utilities may either be water or sewer put in. But when you get into a, a wall, it's, it's a structural thing. I mean, obviously, a building and other things are structural. And it, I have... I guess I have problems with, okay, at what height do we require you to have a bond? At what point do we re release that bond? Uh, you know, there wasn't really structural problems until the, the wall was finished on 74, then all of a sudden we started having structural problems. And, you know, if we'd had a bond, would we, obviously we would have, you know, not released that bond, but I think from a liability standpoint, and I think the county attorney would agree with me, that we don't want to get into the situation where we're out there re repairing the wall. We want to make sure that the developer or the engineers involved who designed the thing to come in and be part of that correction process. And I think that's where we are with the wall on 74 currently. Long term, if there's a wall that's over 40 feet, we want to have a system of long term monitoring. We want to make sure that within 30 days of completion that there's a survey crew there that puts in permanent markers on the ground that, that are, have a dedicated easement. We want markers on that wall uh, to, to be able to, whether it's six months if there's an issue or 20 years there's an issue with that wall, we want to make sure that somebody can come in, an engineer can pick up those points, they're tied to the North Carolina grid, 
and they can tell that there's an issue, that that wall is moving <coughs> no matter what part of that wall may, may have some structural problems. So I think this is very important, like I say, for high walls. Uh, we had, a, like I said, we had a, a lot of input on this from surveyors and from engineers. And I think this is a very good idea that, that like I say, that will protect us and the developer and the citizens that may live near the wall, on top of the wall, uh, down the road. So in a nutshell, this is what that we're proposing tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. So John, is, is it fair to say that if this had been in place, the monstrosity on US 74 would not have been built, could not have been built? Not with the, obviously with the, the 80 foot, 82 feet. I mean, that wall isn't broken into two sections. You, you know, I think when, we as staff made recommendations to the planning board is that with, with the step backs in a wall, if I go up 20 foot and I step back 10, I go up 15 and I step back 10, I go up 15 and I step back 10, at some point I'm using a lot of land up. And the purpose of there was to make the developer stop and think, hold on, I've lost, you know, it may be an acre, it may be two acres, is there a better way that I can do this? other than to build a very large high wall. And I think that's one thing. But on the other end is that we want to try to put some landscaping. That if, if it is a high wall, being that it's over the, the 20 feet if it's, if it's next to a road, or 30 feet if it's not, that there is trees, bushes, shrubbery, and vines, and supports for those vines to be growing on the wall. So I think that if you have to have a large wall, then we're trying to reduce that visual impact that may occur out there. Are there any color requirements or anything uh, as far as earth tone or anything now, like and that? We talked about that. I mean, obviously, most walls, when you look at it, have kind of a concrete or a light brown or a dark brown base. And some of them incorporate where there's stone uh, or there's other designs. But really, I think from our standpoint and the planning board standpoint, we were more, I guess, interested in landscaping. And, you know, you don't run across like roofs where there's a red roof or a bright blue roof on retaining walls. So I think it's more of that, okay, how are we going to cover that naturally then? I mean, if, you'd have to say if the, the building on, or I mean, the, the wall on 74 was, it looked like some kind of rock, it still would be intrusive to a lot of people being as high as it is. So I don't think that, like I say, we were more, in, more looking at Okay, structurally, how we set this back and make it safer, how do we reduce that impact on the, on the visual impact on the neighborhood or the people that may be passing near the wall? And are the people that, des I guess two questions about the people that design it. The people that design it, do you feel good that by requiring the certification of the person who designs it, <clears throat> is that gonna maximize our ability to deal with mistakes and safety violations and problems? Without a doubt, I mean, obviously, an engineer has a seal. So when a, when that person puts their seal on a set of plans, I mean, they're basically putting their reputation on the line. They're putting their license on the line, and they're also putting their insurance company at risk. Uh, all I have to do, I think, if if I'm a professional, if I have uh, a failure, and I get my insurance company involved, uh, there's going to be an issue the next time that I design a wall. And, you know, the, the engineer that designs the wall is the expert. I mean, if you look in, in building permits, guy that comes in, I mean, the architect has designed it, there's been an engineer involved in, is doing the electrical layout, the HVAC, and it's the same difference there. They're saying that, you know, by the state of North Carolina, I've been issued this license, and I'm basically saying that, yes, this is correct. I mean, and from our standpoint, being from the planning department or, or inspections and permits, you know, we trust that you have been trained right and, you're gonna, and you are certifying to your best ability that this is correct. Well, I like the idea that, that we're gonna let the free market system kind of regulate and police it by getting these folks on the line when they do things that are unsafe or things that, they, that aren't gonna work out. Um, the final question is, is there any requirement for the the people wanting to build retaining walls to give you or uh, 
planning staff in any, in any level a visual of how it will look? Yeah, we want elevations. When the, when the plans come to the planning board, I mean, we want elevation drawings to show, okay, this is what this is going to look at. We want elevations from northeast, south, and west so that the planning board can make that determination that uh, this, this is something that we can accept or this is something that we can't accept. Was this in effect when the monstrosity was approved? Uh, no, sir. The visuals? No, it was not. Because it seems like I, I, I've had, I, and we've all had a lot of comments about it, and, you know, it seems like if you just, if we could have seen it beforehand, it would have never been approved to look as horrible as it does. Yeah, I mean, obviously. Was it in effect? That's the answer, I guess. Really? Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. If there are none, then we'll start our public hearing. Thank you. And we'll do three minutes. And if you'll give your name and where you're from, we'll start the public hearing at uh, 519. Any members of the public? Uh, Milton, Dr. Bird. And this, of course, will be limited to discussions of the retaining wall ordinance that we've just heard the uh, uh, PowerPoint on. Yes, thank you. My name is Dr. Milton Bird, Buncombe County resident. Um, looking at your retaining wall ordinance, I had two questions. Uh, with most retaining walls, any wall over four feet has a groundwater issue for its drainage. And I've heard nothing in discussion in regards to groundwater management. And if you have a wall, let's say, that's 20 feet tall, obviously there's going to be groundwater redirection there, and there may be some stormwater management implications. So I would ask any wall over 20 feet or appropriate to engineering that would look at groundwater management and stormwater management. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Byrd. Any other public comment tonight on this? Mr. Rice? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I think if we were looking at this as the wall of China, and it was built like a wall of China, we wouldn't be here discussing it today. It'd be standing. I think a question I have is more to the legal side of it. Is the taxpayers of Buncombe County going to be uh, legally uh, binding for this debt, even if it was under the code at that time? Uh, if it was built under what we said build it by? Then, uh, then is that going to obligate the contractor a way out to where he's not going to be financially or she going to be financially uh, uh, holding the debt? Or is the county going to be holding the debt? I think that's a big question for the taxpayers of Buncombe County. Uh, the safety part of it, it's an eyesore, <laughs> but it's a safety issue when you see those cracks in that thing. And I don't see how anybody could have looked at them plans and have made a decision to let them go in the first place. So I think uh, it goes back to the ordinance. Uh, should we have the planning board, if they've got uh, men sitting on that board that is supposed to be architects and people of great degree, to me, I would question the ability of the people on the planning board and whether or not they were capable of making that decision or not. And then the final decision rested with the county commissioners after the planning board. So I'm questioning it all the way from beginning to end on this one. But at the end of the day, is the liability going to affect us as a taxpayer? All right. Thank on you, this Mr. Price. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's answer at the end. Let's go ahead and any other public comment, and then we'll answer them all. <coughs> Okay, if there's no other public comment, anybody else, last call? Any other public comment? Uh, we'll close public comment at 5.23. Uh, John, uh, one question from Dr. Bird was the groundwater issue, and then Mr. Rice asked about the obligation of Buncombe County. Maybe just give a status of that, even though we're talking about an ordinance. As far as stormwater, I mean, that's incorporated in the development. I mean, we have, they have to submit, the developer has to submit plans that address stormwater. Groundwater, I've never known of an issue where a retaining wall obviously had affected groundwater. Uh, obviously in the design, the 
the engineer has got to take into account the amount of water that's coming down behind the wall, infiltrating down, and that forced and, and designed accordingly. The, this particular project went to the Board of Adjustments because the Board of Adjustments, it's a plan unit development. Uh, right now, I think that when you look at, when you put a stop work order on somebody, uh, at some point, they're going to come around simply because they cannot continue to do the development and that that always I think that's the last resort we wanted want to do as far as trying to issue one of those but that <coughs> usually brings a, a developer around where things get solved and and that's what's happening uh, with the 74 problem that's out there with the retaining wall there I don't, I don't see any any reason or any way that we're on the hook. Now, maybe Michael, Michael Free would want to address that, but I don't see that we're obligated to get involved simply because it's if the developer's got to come to the issue if they want to continue that development. They've got to fix uh, the wall. Ms. Prim? Yeah, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Any, any, any remedies or any fix at this point is strictly the responsibility of the uh, of the owners of the property, the design engineers and the contractors, et cetera, on site. So how long has this stop order been been in, in effect? Since January. And it's been seven, almost gone, gone seven months, and they have they been talking to you and working with you? or They have been talking to Matt Stone in, in the permits office. Uh, but there was a long discussion on exactly which engineer was going to sign off on <coughs> The design of the wall. I think that's one of the things that we brought back in this recommendation that basically have one responsible engineer. Now I think that they're, what they're trying to do is figure out what kind of corrective measures that they're going to do to, to fix the issues with the wall. But there'll be nothing, stop order by definition, nothing, there's no safety issues because nothing's built on top there yet and until and if it is, um, I guess we're, we're, the people, are, it's fine. Well, at this point, Mr. Chairman, if I might interject, I mean, uh, those engineers and whatnot, speaking to Matt Stone and permitting, he's allowed them to go on to make sure things don't deteriorate. So they're trying to at least maintain it. They're allowed to maintain it and make sure something doesn't get worse. Okay. Well, let, let's say, well, I don't know. I, I guess we shouldn't talk about pending case. But if, but if it didn't get fixed, what's our remedy? What's the remedy of, of this, this thing that's out there now under our the law that was in effect at the time. Can we do anything besides just say don't don't finish it? Offhand, I've not researched that. I think it might end up being a legal battle between those design professionals and the owner of the property. Um, it and it would not be our uh, issue to go in and try to repair or remove. Okay. Any questions or any comments? Okay, we've had a public hearing. There's a pending ordinance. Is there any motion? Uh, make a motion we adopt the pending ordinance. Second. Been a motion by Commissioner Peterson, a second by Commissioner Bailey. Is there any further discussion? And thank the Planning Board and Planning Department for their hard work. I know this has been a real <coughs> process. We appreciate it. Thank you. And I think this is new ground for the Western North Carolina, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not aware of. Uh, you know, the city does address retaining walls in their ordinance, but the county-wise, I don't know of anybody that has gone down this path. So once again, Buncombe County is blazing the trail on a We're new... plowing new ground. Plowing new ground. <laughs> okay. Building a new wall. <coughs> yes. All right. Any other comments or questions? <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Well, I'm just... I appreciate it, too. I think this... I think we all know this was wrong and hope we can fix it but we can fix it from here on out for sure Thank all those in favor say aye. Aye. aye aye all opposed no we adopt the new ordinance as proposed uh five zero thank you dr green uh county manager report oh, somebody's already thrown it away okay right. <laughs> that one right. <clears throat> mr chairman and commissioners um I wanted to start tonight with talking about the fee schedule that you, you find on your agenda. Uh, at our last meeting, we asked you to change the ordinances so that 
instead of the fees being set in the ordinance, you had the authority as a Board of Commissioners to set those fees. So we have those before you tonight. And if you take a look at the fee schedule in red, you will see the current or the fact that there's no change uh, to the proposed fee, which is in black. I wanted to just hit the highlights on two or three of these. One, I would tell you that these are comparable to other uh, or below other large uh, local governments in Western North Carolina. Uh, and we compared it to, to Hendersonville and Asheville. If you just come down and look at these fees, like adult establishments, that was adopted in 1995, has not been changed since. Some of the subdivision ordinances, uh, those fees were adopted in 1994, and we have, we've never changed those or had those fees. Manufactured home parks, minor, uh, minor parks, 19 units or less. Uh, we, we set that fee in 1996 and have not changed it. Major uh, home parks, we set that fee in 2001 and have never changed it. Uh, sign permits, when that was adopted in 1994, uh, we have not changed those fees. Uh, cell towers was adopted in 97 and we have not changed those fees. So you can see it's been a long time since we've really looked at them closely and changed the fees. Uh, so we are asking you tonight to set this fee schedule, to adopt this fee schedule. We have not incorporated any increase in revenue in our budget simply because, you know, our, our permits have been flat for a while. We are, we are hoping to see some turnaround in that, but, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the fee schedule. Uh, but you can see here what the fees were, and what we're asking you to change them to, if we're asking you to change them at all. Thank you. Okay, any questions? All right. Any questions about the budget? Uh, we've already had a presentation. I'd, I'd like to make a couple. I'd okay. like for yes, you to do the fee schedule first, if you don't mind. Oh, certainly. Move accept the fee schedule. I second that motion. Okay. It's been a motion by Vice Chair Stanley to accept the fee schedule as proposed. Second by Commissioner Peterson. Is there any discussion? And, and we did get it out so people could kind of look. Yes, at it. it's been okay. it's been out there um, for several days now. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor of adopting the fee schedule as proposed, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The motion carries 5-0. County budget. Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay. Just a couple of comments on the budget. You know, we delivered the message on the 17th. We've made a, a few small changes on it but want to, and want to point those out to you. Uh, we're proposing in this ordinance that you have before you tonight, a general fund budget of $257,470,263. That is up $320,000 from what we brought you on the 17th. It's to address some public safety overtime issues, forest service, and some contract for legal, uh, legal services with fiscal legal. Um, we have continued between the message and now to work with our departments, and we are, um, when we had originally asked you to appropriate nine, uh, seven, seven million six hundred ninety-two thousand dollars in fund balance, we have reduced. We ask you to adopt seven million nine hundred sixty-two thousand dollars, and we have dropped that to seven million six hundred ninety-two thousand. So it's a two hundred seventy thousand dollar decrease in the fund balance we're appropriating. Just a lot of good work, a lot of cooperation with our departments. So we're going in with a little more in the budget and a little less in the fund balance appropriation. We're very very happy about about being able to do that and happy to answer any questions that you do have about the uh, ordinance and uh, look forward to actually being able to adopt it. We've tried <laughs> several times now. <laughs> well, I am, when the time is, is nigh, I am going to move that we adopt the 2011-12 the budget. But before I do that, I want to say, I say that with special thanks to our county manager and the people in our finance office the hard work that they've done but a very special thanks to the the folks who run our departments and the hard work that they've done over months to um, they were asked to decrease their budgets and they've done that I think they have um, they continue to to um, give the services to our our citizens who um, depend on us to do that our core services and they've done that reduced amount of funding I want to make sure that we underline the fact that we have kept education whole in Buncombe County. And I know this has been said, but I think it's, it's a good plan now to say it again that we have um, also budgeted the money to open the two new intermediate schools for Buncombe County schools. I think that says to our public that we hold education to a very high standard and we expect um, 
that our citizens will appreciate that. I think it also says that our, our management and the staff here realizes the importance, as the commissioners have stated many times, that core services are so important, that we provide for our citizens and that we get up every day thinking about providing for our citizens um, education, safety, health and well-being, fun. And I think we've, we've talked about all those things tonight. It's just um, a real pleasure to be a, a part of a, a um, commission that thinks along those lines. And it, as I said, Mr. Chairman, I would like to recommend the adoption of this budget. Second. Been a motion by Commissioner Peterson, a second by Vice Chair Stanley. Are there any further comments? Yeah, Mr. I just Jones? have a couple of quick little requests. Um, so there's one section in here because two of the things that are uh, big things that are going to change next year are how are, are contracting with some other uh, fine agencies and capable agencies to deliver services that we had been delivering. And one of them had to do with our prenatal services, which mm -hmm. is near and dear to my heart and mm -hmm. kind of go forward with a lot of fear and trembling. But after the um, Winch's presentation a, um, a month or so ago, um, I'm heartened a bit because of the, the accountability that we all saw in terms of, you know, a year after the fact and kind of hearing back about their, about their outcomes. So I just want to make sure for both the, the prenatal services that we have a similar type of benchmarking that we do, um, you know, perhaps a formal report is not necessary except for maybe once a year, but maybe the, it, it can come. Y'all probably have got a lot of this stuff in in, uh, in stone already. The other one has to do with, with their mountain mobility, contracting that out as well, and that's going to be kind of a new, uh, a couple of new entities that are involved with both the operations and the, and the routes and whatnot. So could, could I re also request some benchmarking around that and some accountability coming back and forth to make sure, it, because these are really important services for our s citizens and to know that, you know, we're, we're measuring them and we're capturing them and we're making sure everything keeps going well. And uh, we absolutely feel feel very passionate about that. The contract on prenatal, uh, it, there are four players in this, Mayhack, Winches, Health Department, and, and Western North Carolina Community Care. Uh, we did pull that contract up, and there are 11 performance measures in that contract, and we'll be watching that on a very, very regular basis with the um, and be able to report back to you on how that is going. So we're very conscious of that. Great. The contract on uh, transportation is being developed, and it will have an uh, you know, equal focus on benchmarks and measures, and we watch those things really on a monthly basis to make sure we're getting the performance that we're looking for, um, and then have some regular meetings with. Uh, we've always had regular meetings on, with winches on on the uh, primary care, and we'll do s similar things on prenatal, and we'll be meeting regularly with uh, Landis Sky and with McDonald on transportation. Those contracts for the transportation part are still being developed, but those measures will be there. That's great. I appreciate that, and. Um Good, great work. I can't. I couldn't add much more kudos than have already been added, but um, I feel good about where we're going. All right, and I'd agree. I think I think the public would also benefit if you could just work those into the manager reports. Yeah. Um, the thing I'd like to say about it is that, you know, we start off. We gave you three instructions. We said keep the tax rate the same because we didn't think people could afford an increase in the tax rate. We ask you to preserve people's jobs. And I think we've done that. Uh, how many P what number are we at now as far as folks that do not have jobs as a result of the budget? The last I checked, we, had, we still had five. Five out of how out many of employees? Out of 93. 93. Um, and five out of how many total employees? Oh, uh, we started the year with 1526, and right now we're, um, uh, we're actually we're at 1421 as we That's, start July 1st. And we're still working with them? We are. Uh, as Commissioner Peterson said, we do the core services. And the one that I'm the most proud of in this budget is education. Because I, I had the pleasure of going out to Irwin High School and I spoke to um, the student council out there. And Adam West, who is going to be an East Carolina student this fall, went out and he got all these letters signed by people in the Irwin area saying, please don't hurt education. Now, this is a fellow that's not going to even benefit directly from Irwin High School next year. But he took his time to do this. We've all heard from people. This is a small sample of things that the community supports education. And as Commissioner Peterson said, 
we are not only supporting it by the same rate, we're actually giving an increase to open the two new schools. And uh, that's not the way a lot of political bodies have handled budget crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, they've laid it out. They've laid education out in a lot of places. And I'm proud that this board didn't do that. We have a lot of educators, all of you educators, and um, that was the right call. It was the right thing to do because that's the best investment we can make in our community is to make sure we have educated workforce. So I'm, I'm thrilled at it. Uh, I'm glad. I think it took a lot of hard work. And I was real impressed with the community's understanding that education is a core service. Any other comments? Call for the question. All right. In that case, we will call the question. All those in favor of adopting the county budget as presented today, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. We have a budget by a 5-0 vote. Thank you very much, Dr. Green. Thank Next, you, we have a resolution authorizing the county manager to execute an interlocal agreement between this, uh, with the city of Asheville for the construction of a long-requested sidewalk on Emma Road near Emma School. Mr. Creighton. Mr. Chairman, board members, uh, I think in the pre-session you, you talked about that this has been a long time coming, and I was trying to think today just how long it has been, and it's, it has been a very long time. But give you a little background. Uh, I'll just say several years ago, there was a, there was a group in the community members in the Emma community that, that had formed a safer walk for Emma. And at that time, DOT had money, a program called uh, Safe Routes to School, where they would, the, the city, it was for cities, so the city had to participate in it. Uh, part of the sidewalk going to Emma is in the county, so that's where we got involved in the process. Basically, the city can't maintain a sidewalk that's outside their jurisdiction. But DOT, in order to give the grant money, had to have a responsible party to make sure that they were going to maintain the sidewalk both inside the municipality and outside. And that's where we came to the table. We wrote a letter of support, and like I say, with the city's leadership, um, they were able to not only get money through this program, but also through CDBG and some transit money, all federal money, to uh, get the easements, do the design, and to start the sidewalk. And part of that ending process is today that we're going to sign an interlocal agreement with the city of Asheville to maintain our portion of the sidewalk so that they can go ahead and get the project started. It's anticipated that they'll start in the fall. This is about a four-tenths of a mile sidewalk a part of a larger project that will bring sidewalks all the way from Patton Avenue up north Louisiana to Emma School. So I think this is a it's a great thing. One, the community the community has not given up over the years of getting this money. And two, uh, like I say, with us and the city getting together, we're gonna make the citizens, at least of the Emma community, very happy. So that's where we come with the interlocal agreement today. Thank you. Any questions? I think it's really exciting, and I appreciate all y'all's efforts. And this is a great example of you know city county working together. And I mean, the thing I'm the most excited about are all those kids being a lot safer, as well as you know the, there's a lot of folks that just walk up and down to, to get to work and whatnot too. So the safety's going to be greatly improved. And even though it's a long time coming, I think we're here. And thanks for all your cooperative efforts. Yeah, it, it has been a long time, but it, it has been really good. Yeah, I want to thank the Emma Elementary School community because they, people have been asking for this for years, and it just took a lot of time to put it together legally. And uh, I want to thank our partners at the City Council because I know a lot of them have worked on this a long time, too. And I'm, I'm off the go. I think uh, Commissioner Jones was on the City Council. We probably talked to you about that when you were uh, across the street. So this is a, well, a long-term thing and I'm, I'm also glad that it's finally going to happen. Any other comments or questions? Is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, move the approval of the interlocal agreement. Second. There's been a motion by Vice Chair Stanley, a second by Commissioner Jones. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. No. aye. All opposed, no. The motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Next, we have an add-on uh, lease of the uh,
property concerning a cell tower. Mr. Frew, if you'll tell us a little bit about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. i um, here before you today because we need a, a new public safety tower out in the Emma, uh, we'll strike that we just did Emma Road. This is out in Lees Creek Road, Leicester, near the public safety center. Uh, we've had a tower out there for some period of time, and uh, uh, the gentleman uh, opted out of that contract, so we need a new site. And the uh, Buncombe County Board of Education has been kind enough to offer us a location for $1 a year for 20 years on the site. So we're just asking approval of the resolution, the attached lease, and it'd be $1 a year for a 20-year term, and we'll put in it has good access, and it's right next to the Public Safety Center. I move approval. Second. Okay, there's been a motion by Commissioner Bailey, a second by Commissioner Peterson. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. We will adopt the motion 5-0. Next up, we have uh, board appointments. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, nominate the following for the Mountain Area Workforce Development Board, David Bailey, Brian Dover, Bill Maloney, and Dusty Rhodes. Okay, is there any other, any other nominations? All those in favor of Mr. Bailey, Mr. Dover, Mr. Maloney, and Mr. Rhodes say aye. 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 All opposed, no. They are reappointed. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to recommend uh, for approval Mr. Ray Spell to the Buncombe County Technical Community College. Any other nominations? All those in favor of reappointing Mr. Spell say aye. 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 He is reappointed. Library Board of Trustees, two vacancies. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to nominate uh, Megan Gordon and Eleanor Johnson to. Um, fill the two vacancies on the Library Board of Trustees. Are there any other nominations? All those in favor of Ms. Gordon and Ms. <coughs> Johnson say aye. Aye. They are, re they are appointed Board of Social Services. Mr. Chairman, it's my <coughs> pleasure to recommend Bill McElrath for reappointment. Are there any other nominations? All those in, in favor of appointing our former county manager, Bill McElrath, to the reappointment, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. <coughs> Mr. McElrath is reappointed. The next meeting of our board will be June 28, 2011. Uh, this will be a continuation meeting, I believe. Is that right, Madam Clerk? As soon as we do it. <laughs> Beginning at 5 o'clock. Members of the uh, board will attend the National Association of County uh, Commissioner's Annual Conference in Multnomah, Multnomah. Multnomah County, Oregon, uh, July 15 through 19. Uh, this board will meet July 26, beginning at 5 p.m. That will be our next regular scheduled meeting other than the continuation meeting. And commission meetings can be seen on BCTV Charter Cam uh, Channel 2 on Tuesday and Thursday at 8 p.m., Wednesday at 3 p.m., and Saturday and Sunday at 9 a.m. or anytime online at buncombecounty.org. Next matter of business we have is public comment. Uh, this will be three minutes. Uh, you uh, will an we'll answer any questions after the meeting. And this is uh, if you'll give your name and where you're from. Any public comment tonight? Yes, ma'am, Hope. Ms. Herrick? As I was walking by a newsstand last Friday, I noticed the headline from the Asheville Citizen Times, which read, County May Buy Vulgar Factory. I would like to know what economic incentives are you planning to give a company that would bring up to 400 jobs? And if there is a company thinking about moving into the vulgar plan, why don't they buy it? Also, with Volga paying taxes on that property, and if you buy it, there goes a the large tax base. I think the public should know more about the details before you gamble with $7 million that we may end up paying. Thank you, Ms. Herrick. Any other public comment? 
Yes, ma'am. Front row. If you'll hold on just a minute, let her change out the mic. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, good evening. Uh, my name is Leanne Smith. I'm a librarian with the county school system and a mother of two sons, both of whom have survived tumors, one a benign bone tumor, the other a, ma a malignant thyroid cancer. I live within a mile of the CTS site in Arden. Others in my community are also here tonight, and I would like to invite you all to stand with me. I'm here on behalf of my community to let you know that we are making headway in developing a partnership with the EPA as we strive to address the cleanup of contaminants at the site. I'm also here because we're deeply concerned about the physical state of the abandoned CTS building. An EPA contractor working on a sampling plan a couple of weeks ago photographed the building both inside and out and shared with us pictures which, which clearly demonstrate a compromised structure such as major holes in the roof um, and piping and duct work hanging precariously from the ceiling. We are also concerned that this building is a fire hazard. Additionally, the photographs revealed fresh graffiti inside the building indicative of gang and drug-related activities. As a mother, a teacher, and a member of the South Asheville community, I am concerned for the health and safety not only of those who have claimed this dilapidated building as their turf, but for the families living near the CTS site who may be subjected to gang and drug-related crime. In accordance with the Buncombe County Ordinances 10-126 through 10-136, the community would like to request that the CTS building be condemned and would like to solicit the help of Mr. Matt Stone to do so. I'm confident that we can all work together to ensure the well-being of our families, friends, and neighbors. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And we will definitely get with legal about that and find out and and find uh, what we can do. Thank you. Why can't we condemn it? Can we? I'd be happy to look into that and make a recommendation to okay. the board. You find out a way to condemn it. Can we, can we also contact the sheriff's department and see about patrols out there as well? Well, sure. Yeah. And is, is that something we can take up at our next meeting? What's... Okay. Well, let's, these folks have been here a long time. Let's, as soon as we can, let's let's get this information for them and see what we can do and not do. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment tonight? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Uh, I recognize you, Miss Landis. You can go ahead if you'd like. Before I begin, I think I better. Um, uh, ask Michael Fru. I had spoken with the state attorney general's office and they had said that I should speak with you concerning a possible um, how do I say that infraction would you identify my violation would I be allowed to continue and would that um, um, hurt me in any way if I were to continue to speak today I don't know the question but I'd be happy to speak with you after this uh, meeting okay I am Reverend Lisa Landis, GLO, L A D Y. You can find me in a search engine. I am a spiritual teacher. My religious practice does not allow me to use negative thoughts, words, and actions to anyone. Before I came here, I was in the safety and security industry and I chose to get a notarized statement to walk away from a billion dollar industry because I knew the man was not just. As it said in the Bible, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I did not wish him harm, I wished him well. The man was sentenced to 20 years in prison, but I had nothing to do with that. Those of my faith before me have been crucified and have been burned at the stake. Now, false accusations of threats and attacks slander spiritual teachers. My show was produced under the First Amendment platform six hours per month, 
Now I'm lucky to get six minutes. minutes. I educated and entertained was the purpose of my show. Did you know that alcoholism is a fatal disease that is a chemical imbalance in your brain until it is addressed? Yet the chemical justice system continues to profit on the disease and decay in society. Did you know that there's now a treatment center for first responders in the United States? But then you have to wonder about the state-run ABC stores and the treatment centers. The majority of crime committed under the influence of alcohol or drug or to acquire alcohol or drugs. You know, the, the question is, you know, do you want to solve the problems of society or do we profit from it? And until there is a department of peace, I say war will be viewed as a profit for few. And how is BCTV getting funding and to what amount? There is another question um, about URTV not being in the budget. Um, I'm sorry, somebody else had helped me with some questions and I'm not quite sure. If that's not in your budget, then where's the video sales tax for? Was that a lie? What do you mean we're not going to move forward? Your TV is not in your budget, then why would you um, have worried about it? You're redirect, sorry, I didn't get to finish okay, my Ms. questions. Lamas. If and you yes, want to leave any papers you. for us, we'll be glad to I put that I will speak with him afterwards, thank you. That'd be fun. Okay, any other public comment tonight? Oh, yes, sir, Lucia, you raised your hand or if you want to speak. Okay. okay, if you don't, okay, he's, he doesn't want to speak. All right, he's first in. Uh, brother, you're next. My name is Barry Durand. Uh, I've been working with the uh, the folks in uh, the Mills Gap area trying to get the CTS plant cleaned up. And uh, um, I uh, wanted to reiterate uh, um, what Leanne said uh, and also, uh, you know, encourage the county to uh, you know join the effort the momentum that's beginning to build uh, with us uh, with EPA uh, we have a, um, a wonderful new team at EPA who's who's uh, working with us and so um, this is a, uh, could be a very important moment so I just wanted to mention that thank you thank you thank Barry you. thanks for your long-standing work on this and I, uh, I just wanted to kind of make a note that I, I believe all our county staff is is involved in 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 the efforts in the present at a lot of the meetings so I'm glad that it's all coming together and there's some momentum and and we're at the table with y'all so good brother Christopher brother Christopher and I come in the name of Yahweh or Yeshua conspiracy when a democracy gets so far in debt that it can't pay the debt, which is where we're at now. That's what China requires us to pay in gold to the loans we have taken. When it starts down, it starts declining into dictatorship, the loss of freedoms. We see it every day. Conspiracy, not directly against freedom of speech, Though it is the content that is the reason the direct conspiracy has not been against freedom of speech, but rather through freedom of the press. See, freedom of the press is where the anointing, you might say, the power behind the word. See, I get out Pritchard Park and I can let 60 people know by my voice, you know me, I could stand at the end of this wall and make it so loud you'd cover your ears. But like right now, the only one seeing me is this room until you get through editing and put it on TV. Still is funny you won't put yours live. At least the city's got the guts for that, even in the middle of a conspiracy. The conspiracy from the beginning has been to give the appearance of public access, charge for it, keep the money, and get rid of it. There's some video of our former President Nixon when it came to the medical and they said, hey, look, we got a plan to give for a lot of money, very little. And as the money increases, you get less and less and less. Same way, that's what happened with URTV. Only time is getting very quick. That's why it had to get shut down quickly. Because of this little monk and many others like me who could not just give information. See, my show was not about giving information. 
It's out there. You yourself gave the conspiracy on the last meeting. You yourselves agreed to that conspiracy by keeping silent. And this conspiracy to end URTV could woo, put a brush on a lot of people. All the way back to the original starters of URTV itself and the city and the county. It's interesting that this is going on in our and there doesn't seem to be any fear because I just found out today that our Attorney General of North Carolina, he really ain't going to start anything. No fear. Except for one thing. You not only defrauded the state, you defrauded the federal government. They set up an agenda. They said, we want public access. You said, we'll do it for $274,000 a year. You sold them. You sold them the goods. Now you have to provide it. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Brother Christopher. God Almighty. Thank you, uh, Miss Green. We've been accused of conspiracy, fraud, mismanagement of money. What uh, would you comment on that? I think there are several things. I understand the level of upset about uh, the channel going off the air. When it was a charter agreement, it was certainly an easier fund of streaming, uh, a funding stream to follow, uh, and we had laid out from a local perspective, the ability to provide more funding for the public channel than we provided for education or government. When that was changed with the, uh, by adding a second provider of services here in the community, the state changed a lot of things about th that funding stream and how it flowed. Our requirement was for subscriber fees that we share that with channels that we certified. We certified URTV and we certified BCTV. We were not required to share the fund, any other stream of funding, and we didn't share any other stream of funding. It really doesn't matter how much somebody puts forward in a budget. I could come in here and say we need a $500 million budget, but the reality in life is we can have the budget we can afford, not the one we say we want. So we are fine that they say they want a budget like that, but the reality in our life is we can we provided the funding that we were required Are to provide. Are you then the 1.5 no, 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 this year? Uh, Just, you've had public, this is public comment, brother. So if you'll, um, so you're you need to see the 1.5 million this year. Uh, the 1.5 million is really something that, that has been misconstrued by URTV, and, and they've done that very consistently. The state auditor has reviewed the distribution of these funds. We've talked to them repeatedly, and uh, while we do not have the written report, we have been told by the state auditor that there is no indication that Buckham County owes URTV anything at all. Um, and I, I'm very confident after the review that they did that they were very thorough in everything they looked at, and their opinion is we do not know, owe URTV anything. So the state of North Carolina has looked at our records and our expenditure of the funding stream we got that has been repeatedly said was uh, required to be turned over to URTV, and yes. we never have the whole time we got it. Uh, that, that's, once the, the rules changed in Raleigh, we, we provided exactly what we were required to provide. The state auditor reviewed all the legislation, and uh, they're, they're very clear that we've provided to URTV what we were legally required to provide to them. And what was required is really irre irrelevant compared to their, I mean, their budget's irrelevant compared to the funding source. They can only spend what we can give them, or we can only give them what we're required to. And what the city also gave. The city gave them a lot of money. The city has picked up the equipment, um, and uh, we are going to be having an RFP in, in, in the coming weeks with the city. And I do also want to say, or Kathy might like to say, we are live streaming this, uh, our meetings and have been for several weeks. So, you know, we, we've just heard many weeks and I think there's a lot of high level of frustration with the URTV folks about the way this has been handled mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad I would like that report made public and made part of our minutes when we get it we will and and be very above board and um, and make sure that we do it the right way and the RFP is a request for proposal which means at some point there's going to be a a request show us what you would do with this and I don't know how that's going to look because the city's working with us but it's going to be primarily city driven since they have the equipment is that right is that fair to say so there, there's another shot I don't know what it will be because it's not our organization that's going to be putting it out so any any other questions about this okay next public comment Mr. Rice Mr. Chairman, members of the board. 
the budget of Buncombe County. I guess uh, about the only thing we get to talk on that really don't get any action, but the taxpayers of Buncombe County, they need a tax decrease in their property tax. Uh, you didn't have a reevaluation. That was on purpose so you could gain more money. You're not revenue neutral. You just keep increasing in money. You got money at the county school system, a bankroll over there that they don't even need. Uh, you can talk about good education, which we do get a good education. We've got a very small amount numbers of people that is going to be going to Buncombe County School and Ashford City School compared to what the buildings are out there. We talk about these intermediate schools. They're more fuss over them than what they really should have been. They're not even something that's across the state. This is a cutting edge. It might be coming one day that they make a great charter school because they're small schools. That might be the future for that. But my concern is, is why that we are spending so much money on capital, buying the building across the street, renovating it for a million dollars or so, buying the big Almaco building down the street, now we're talking about Volvo. We're talking about the courthouse building. We're talking about all this capital money. And the only way that this money has come about, in my opinion, is the taxpayers of Buncombe County is not getting a break. But the county government is growing. Now, whether you're cutting people or not, that's not what I'm talking about. When you keep growing buildings and cutting employees, what's the difference? You're putting the money on that end instead of the other end. To get the newspaper to cover it honestly in either direction for any newspaper sitting in this room, they're so biased that they don't even know which ends up, and they're supposed to be the First Amendment people. I can talk to them. I can give them information, but it don't help to give them information. They won't use it, but they take you in as authority figures. But let me tell you, they're not getting the real truth about how much money Buncombe County's got. My, my concern is that we give the taxpayers of Buncombe County a reduction, not a little five cent, five whatever, half cent. We need a reduction for people to fill it out here in the community. I'm talking about people that's got property. We're filling it. And don't you think we're not? If 72% of people, I believe, is on the, the uh, uh, what do you call it, the free, uh, not free and reduced lunches, but Food stamps, don't you tell me that they're having a hard time paying their bills on taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Any other public comment tonight? Mr. Fryer? I didn't really mean to come up, but Jerry said pretty well everything that needed to be said for his budget, except we do have a $16 million fireman training center that's I guess part of another deal that money comes from somewhere that we don't have any money in the government anyway. But we talk about education, and we talk about it a lot. A young lady gave me a thing today that she's been looking for a job. She's a graduate, graduated 2010, majored in uh, criminal justice, minor in psychology, 3.5 grade average interned at Buncombe County Department of Justice, uh, worked 21st century program at the YWCA, worked with high-risk middle school children, volunteered at Blue Ridge Addiction Recovery Network in Boone, North Carolina. Here we keep talking about school and go get your educations and do what you can do. This young lady has put out three hundred applications she says I thought I put the wrong phone number or the wrong email on it because she said I've had one call so you know it looks like she's tried to do it the right way but there's no jobs and we're going to learn here in 212 213 214 when you have the revive that there's not you know if we continue down the road that we're going today uh, we're going to be in big trouble. The county is seven point million for Volvo. I do hope it brings 400 jobs. If it don't, uh, I got a problem there. I've still got problems with 
the pay, I look at the high pay of a lot of the upper echelon in Buncombe County versus the ones that work at the trash dump and stuff. Uh, you know, you, they're losing people because they can't even afford to drive the distances now to get to the jobs because gas is so high, but they got locked in for another year without raises. So it's time for all the people to step up and look uh, what they have below. I know, as he said, you're, you're buying buildings, that code to change this and the over here at the courthouse and just tons of things that y'all have purchased. Uh, how are we going to pay for it? We owe $25 million on jail that doesn't have anybody in it. Why are we still buying things? I would just like to know. And you are our commissioners, and it's time to step up and say enough is enough. If there's 400 jobs involved in Volvo, good. If there isn't, turn the deal down, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fryer. Any other public comment tonight? Mr. Chair, I move we continue this meeting until June the 20, what, 7th? 8th. 8th. Second. And a motion by Vice Chair Stanley, a second by Commissioner Peterson to continue this case, uh, this uh, hearing, this meeting, meeting, meeting. meeting. -E -E to the 26th, <laughs> 5 o'clock. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nope. The meeting is adjourned until 26. 28, 28. excuse me. <laughs> Hang in there, Dave. <clears throat> we got a lot of presents today.